Welcome to another Mando Lessons Live. I am Baron Collins Hill. Happy to be spending the next hour with you all. Hope you're all doing well wherever you are in the world. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm a little uh, scattered today because I woke up a little late, so I just kind of got the studio in order and everything in line just in time so i hope i'm coming through loud and clear for you i got some coffee here to help start up my day i don't usually wake up late but there you have it i hope you're all well we got dan denise sheldon peter gail ariel robert jefferson james lewis sean kenneth uncle bobby Andrew, Andrew, right off the bat with the Super Chat donation. Thank you so much, Andrew. Helps me do these live streams. Adds to the coffee fund. Helps to put out new lessons every week, all that kind of stuff. Whether it comes through Super Chat or PayPal donations or Patreon or T-shirts or other merch. And all the links are in the description. Uh, so any way that you, you like to support is highly appreciated. So thank you, Andrew, for that. It says, starting out with one of my favorites. One of my favorites as well. It's like probably my number one go-to Irish tune. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's one a lot of folks know, and it's a great tune. Kevin from Virginia. Osman Juiced. Uh, Ant-Man. Mike. Great. Good to, good to have you all here. Starting out strong with lots of folks. Glad to see it. All right. Let's see. What Ariel says, what have you all been playing today? That's a great question. Let us know and let Ariel know in the chat what uh what everybody's been playing. I've only been playing Miss Monahan's because that's the first tune I've played all day. Hopefully it came through alright and there was no warming up for that one. I like that I started with the big chord, which uh sometimes you just put your fingers in the wrong place. Uh Lewis was saying where let's see. Oh, Sean says, been working on Cherokee Shuffle. Great tune. I love that tune. I haven't played that one in a while myself. Lewis says, was thinking about last this time last year that we had the workshop and concert at Elderly's. Yeah, I was thinking about that as well. About a year ago, I was out in Michigan at the incomparable, incomparable uh, Elderly Instruments with my good friend and co-mandolinist Noah Fishman for a, a set of workshops and concerts um, 
And we did one on Elderly. It was super fun. And Denise and uh, Lewis were both there. And we had a great time. Denise took us out to some most excellent barbecue that I wish I could eat again. And uh, someday I will. Um, but, yeah, it was a good time playing music with other people. I miss it, too. That's what Denise says. Miss playing with other people. Uh, you're not alone. And it'll happen again. All right, Osman from Qatar, very cool. Great to have you here. Awesome. Yeah, we talked fine times. That's a great fine times at our house. Great tune. All right, let's see. Oh, Uncle Bobby, thank you so much for the super chat as well. <coughs> Greatly appreciated. Would you play a tune on your octave mandolin today? Sure. I don't actually have an octave mandolin at the moment, but I have a. I'll play a tune on a bazooki which is how i tuned my octave mandolin anyway so it's it's tuned like an octave mandolin it's just flat top i don't have that one i used in the video anymore um but i do have i'll play a, an octave mandolin style instrument before the day is through ah oh, kevin has a great question i was just watching a video of temperance reel i have played it i can follow it but i can never remember how to start it and i don't have enough of a version under my fingers of my own to just pull it out of nowhere but uh i should really get that that's a classic tune and i can never remember how it goes so i should work on that one all right denise says how about a little fine times for the celebration of the elderly concert i can definitely do that cool early rutland and roanoke that's a great tune i just got a record yesterday of uh it's bill monroe's uncle pen which is a bunch of tunes that he learned from his uncle, who was an old-time fiddle player. Um, it's a great collection. He's got a bunch of Kenny Baker playing fiddle. and it's, it's, a good, it's a good record. I hadn't heard it for a while, and then I found it cheap in a record store, so it was fun listening to that. Uh, Hollow Poplar, James. That's a, I love that tune. That's the one I couldn't think of the name of a couple live sessions back. <laughs> uh... I haven't played since my performance last week. Cool. I'm glad you had a performance. Uh, anyone have some recommend? Oh, I think, Jews, maybe you were asking about microphones. Um, I hope that sh that gig went well. Any recommendations? How about uh, how about Fine Times? That's a good tune. Or Temperance Reel. Farewell the Long Hollow. I've heard of that one, but I don't know it. Uh, having trouble playing the A and F chord. We can definitely work on that. Uh, it was before breakfast, and it was before breakfast. How fitting. Southern Flavor, great Bill Monroe tune. Could I do a transcription of Jerusalem Ridge? Unfortunately, I can't because it's a Bill Monroe, Kenny Baker copyrighted tune, and I don't have any copyrighted stuff on my website, unfortunately. Cherokee Shuffle, old Joe Clark, she bakes you more, working on cross-picking and keeping that machine-like right hand. That's what I like to hear, Gail. Learning some Canadian tunes from the Band of Burns. Great Robbie Burns themed collection. Cool. I'd love to check that out. Salt Creek. Ah, nice. Silk and Bronze Strings on the Washburn. Hope you're enjoying those. Going through my short repertoire, practicing the melodies, and then the chord changes. St. Anne's Reel. Alright, I'll play a little bit of, uh, keep the, I haven't actually gone through my little spiel. The way this works is I love answering questions, so any questions you might have, throw them out there. No question is too uh, advanced or too simple, anything like that. It's all wide open. I like to keep it nice and friendly around here. So yeah, throw out any questions you might have. I love hearing what people are working on in terms of tunes. Keep that stuff coming. I'll play a little fine times and then catch up with the chat again. Uh, let's see, there it is.
little bit of fun times at our house. Uh, somebody asked, uh, Kevin asked if it's on the site. It is on the website, yep. It might have been one of the ones I did with Noah. Um, I did a bunch of lessons off of our album, Fine Times, which you can also find by going to mandolessons.com and then searching. Uh, there's the store tab at the top, and in there you can find that album where we play that tune. Uh, and it is also on the website. We also might have a lesson on, like, talking over the arrangement. I can't exactly remember, but it's on there somewhere. Cool, yeah, I remember recommending. Juice says, uh, I used one of those clip-on mics you recommended. Glad that sounds like it worked out. Glad to hear it. Um, how about the gravel walk? That's another one of those tunes that I can have, like Temperance Reel, that I can play along with, but I don't have on instant recall up in the old noggin. Sukmeet says, how much time does it take to perfect, to, does it take for a perfect tremolo? Great question. Uh, I don't know the answer because I'm still working on it myself. Um, you know, I think it definitely take some practice to get to a point where you're comfortable with it and can sort of get get like a usable tremolo you know so i think a great way to start is to you know just do some simple exercises like uh you can do little bits of scales nice and slow it's like a d scale and then do two each time Try to stay nice and loose, especially in your right hand. And then do uh, four. Make sure you're nice and loose. And then maybe go for a little tremolo. And that can either be, you can either think of it as doing eight pick notes per beat. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 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 Et cetera. Or you can just make it more free form. Oh, tremolo is all about being nice and fluid. So even if you're not playing like a set number, tremolo really varies. You have people who have very exact, precise, rhythmic, measured tremolo. And you have people like David Grisman who is very fluid. volume changes all the time, the speed and intensity change all the time. Um, you know, one of my favorite things to do to practice tremolo is really to just, it's a great time to just like noodle around with a simple, either a simple melody or even not a melody, just kind of, you know, improvise a little on a scale. some double stops things like that and just you know tremolo is all about taking it nice and slow so you you know you don't have to worry too much about making your left hand move really fast you can kind of pick your battles there hope that's helpful I also do have some lessons on my website about uh, kind of staying relaxed while doing tremolo and stuff like that it man says when you play with folks uh, do you mostly play chords and then melody when it's your turn, or do you play the melody the whole time? What's your personal jam etiquette? Uh, for me, it really depends on the style of music. So if I'm playing, assuming I'm playing mandolin in all of these examples, if I'm playing Irish music, I'm going to play melody the whole time. If I'm playing old time music, I'm probably going to play melody the whole time. I might okay like one percent of the time might throw in a little bit of really simple kind of two string chords but for the most part i'm really just focusing on melody if i'm playing bluegrass and we're kind of passing a tune around that style um then i'm playing chords and then melody when it's my turn and improv improvising things like that excuse me things like that now if i'm playing in more of like a band setting 
or like kind of small ensemble, pretty much what I try to do is just kind of read what the situation is. You know, if I show up to an Irish session that maybe people are like taking solos in, that's not particularly traditional Irish, but if that's what's happening, I'm happy to just kind of go with the flow of whatever the rest of the, um, whatever the rest of the musicians there are doing. Um, you know, I kind of go in with my preconceived thought, like, oh, I'm going to an Irish session. I'm probably just playing melody. It's going to be fairly straight ahead. Um, but then if I get there and it's different, that's totally fine. You know, just I kind of try to read the room and see what's going on. And then if you're in, like, a, if you're creating a little ensemble or a band or have a particular vision for a set of music, you know, like when Noah and I play, we're playing traditional tunes. We're playing Fine Times at Our House, which is a classic old-time tune that in a larger jam I just play, might play melody, but with Noah we get to, you know, get weird with it and add crazy intros and outros and take solos and kind of play harmony lines and things like that because it's the two of us and we've kind of decided what, what we like to do um, when playing together and are able to say, okay, yeah, let's, you know, open it up a little bit. Let's, let's break some rules for lack of a better word. Um, so yeah, I think it's very dependent. Sukmeet says, having trouble playing tremolo. Yeah, it definitely takes a little time. Check out the lessons on my website. I go th through all that stuff about staying relaxed and ways to kind of get into it. And mostly just keep trying it. It's one of those things that, you know, it feels pretty unnatural and a little tense to do at first. But if you just keep trying, even if it's one minute a day, then one day it's just going to be like, oh, my hand feels a little more relaxed and I can I can do it without um, without as much issue. I'm currently doing that trying to learn some some two finger banjo style and you know it feels really awkward and I get really tense doing it and I know that one of these days it's just gonna become something's gonna snap in my brain and I'm <laughs> that sounds a little dangerous uh, and it's, it's just gonna kind of fall into place a little bit better. And it's really about getting over that first hump of like, oh, this is hard. I don't know how to do it. And then there's going to be something that kind of clicks for mostly muscle memory in my experience. Like you'll do it and do it and do it. And you'll have to think about what you're doing with your right hand or your left hand or whatever the technique requires. And then one day you'll find like, oh, I'm not really having to think about this kind of technically in the same way that I have in the past. So just keep trying and it'll happen. Juice says, do you have some tips on getting an Irish sound on a tenor banjo? My tunes sound too vanilla for my taste. Sure. Um, I think, let me get a banjo here. So, Irish tenor banjo, tuned the same as a mandolin. Eh, close enough. Um, you know, I think there's a couple things about, like, kind of where you play... Let's see if this is this gonna be too big if I zoom in? Ah, that'll work. Um, so you know, playing pretty close to the bridge will kind of give it that snappy sound. And I think, um, you know, trying to get that really kind of percussive snap out of the instrument. Um, part of that comes from playing closer to the bridge. Part of it is getting a certain swing into your into your playing you know I think if you're coming from mandolin to another instrument that's maybe tuned the same you have a lot of the same things going on the tuning's the same the fingering is maybe the same but you might have to use a different finger here and there and starting out by saying okay I'm going to approach this like I approach the mandolin because they're very similar that's a great way to get some of the fundamentals of the instrument down but then you know as you say like um you know you're having trouble kind of making the tenor banjo really shine. I think what what I, in my journey with the tenor banjo was coming from mandolin, I was like, okay, I'm going to play it like a mandolin. And it didn't really do it for me. And like you said, you know, it's very kind of vanilla at times. But what you can do is just start to realize like what the strengths of the banjo is. You know, you don't, what the strengths of the banjo are. You don't have that same, you know, you don't have sustain like you do on a mandolin. It doesn't sound good in an Irish context to like play chords, in my opinion. But if you kind of kind of embrace the snappiness of it, you, 
you know, I'm pretty much embracing, you know, it, with the mandolin, there's a lot of like, okay, I really want to, you know, make it sound full and lush. And if you do that on a tenor banjo, I'll try. Trying to let each note really ring out. It gets muddy and it gets a little convoluted and it doesn't sound as good to my, in my opinion. But if you really kind of say, okay, I'm gonna, you know, kind of mute off notes early. You know, that sound on a mandolin, that would sound a little choppy and a little rough, but on a tenor banjo, it really kind of comes through as extra percussive. Um, so try, you know, try embracing that percussive nature of the tenor banjo it could be helpful. Love to see you do a tutorial on Eklunda number three. Cool, yeah, I would like to do that. Um, I should have more tenor band, uh, more Swedish tunes on my website than I do. In fact, I'm not sure that I have any Swedish tunes. I guess I have Polska from Morka, which Noah and I did. Uh, Love Fine Times, is it on your site? Yes, it is. Um, the, the full name of the tune is Fine Times at Our House. We just kind of shortened it to find times for the name of the album. Do you have any lessons on cross picking? Yep, if you I think if you just search cross pick or cross picking on my website, it'll be there or if you look in the technique and fundamental section, it's probably under the right hand heading. Um and there's also um a series on like general picking patterns and I think I go over some cross picking there as well. Thank you Michael for the super chat. Really appreciate it. Uh, Andrew says, learned a folk tune that was on an episode of Star Trek and realized it was just Skyboat song. I think I've heard, yeah, that, I, I've never watched Star Trek, um, probably much to my detriment, but, uh, I've heard, I think I've heard that it pops up in there. <laughs> good, to, good to know that it made it to the 24th century. Yeah, that, that one is going to last, no matter what else happens. <laughs> <laughs> Denise says, you give me hope for the future. Yeah, we're all, we'll all still be playing tunes in 300 years. So. What is your suggestion for mandolin cases and armrest? Uh, what's your opinion on a tone guard? This is a question from Joseph. Uh, cases, it can really be all over the map. Like, I, I have a wide taste in cases, I guess. Um, I love, you know, if you need something, I think it depends partly on, like, either the monetary value or like the sentimental value of your instrument. If you like really want to give your instrument the best kind of safest experience, there's things like Calton cases or Hoffy cases. They're both great. Those flight cases, they're really expensive. They're like close to or over a thousand dollars new. So it doesn't make sense to put a $200 mandolin in there, but um, unless it's a $200 mandolin that like is wildly sentimental to you. Um, but then, you know, your average, like, TKL hard case is great. Um, the Gator cases are fine. Um, I really like the Travelite cases. I, I liked them in the past, recently. In the last couple of years when I've tried them, they've been really, I think, like, the factory is using a different glue or something, so they've been really stinky to me, and I'm a little sensitive to smell, so I don't love that. But they're, they're kind of a hard, hard foam case. They're not hard shell, but they're really light and really protective um and they're not wildly expensive i think they're under a hundred dollars and uh gig bags are great if you need to just like throw a an expensive mandolin on your back um there's also like high-end gig bags like mono and uh, reunion blues both make really kind of durable cases you know i think it, it kind of depends i like access gig bags i don't have any of those for mandolin but uh i, I like those for banjo you know, just like, I think it kind of requires kind of balancing the value of your instrument and the sentimental value with, and how you want to use it. You know, if you really want your mandolin on your back, you got to find something like a TKL isn't going to work for you unless you, you kind of DIY rig it up with backpack straps. Whereas a, a gig bag will be often be able to go on your back or they make backpack straps for Caltons and Hoffies. Uh, what was the rest of that question? Uh, mandolin case and an armrest. I like armrests. They're not a necessity by any mean. Um, I use, let me put this 
banjo back. As you can see, I've got an armrest here. This is from uh, Doug Edwards, um, Hill County String Works. Uh, it's called the McClung Armrest. It's just like the, it's a good way to get this in here. It's got a little bit of a angle to it, um, rather than just being straight flat. Um, and I like it, it's very comfortable. I actually, I got into the habit of using armrests. I've lost my pick. Um, I got in the habit of using armrests because I had a mandolin that had a really sharp edge and it was just kind of like digging into my arm and it was very uncomfortable. So I got an armrest for it and then uh, I just kind of, uh, this mandolin is not nearly as sharp on the edge, but I just kind of got into the habit and I like the, the feel, but it's not a big deal for me anyway if it doesn't have an armrest. And the other part of that question is uh, opinions on tone guards. I've gone back and forth with tone guards. I used to have a tone guard. So a tone guard is a little like wire cage that fits on the back of an instrument and holds it away from your body and it kind of changes the sound of the instrument a little bit. And I used to have one on this mandolin for a long time. And then I just kind of got out of the habit of using it and... Um, hey, there's my pick. And... Uh, went to not using it and sold the tone guard um, and then I got um, I, I have an old Gibson mandolin up there it's just out of frame um, but I do have a tone guard on that I got that and I was like you know I think what I found the difference in sound of a tone guard it's not necessarily in my opinion like better or worse it's just a little different um, and just kind of thinking about that difference with the general tonal characteristics of that Gibson, I was like, I think that would work with a tone guard. And I got another tone guard and put it on. I was like, oh yeah, I like that. So, you know, something you can do to try it try it out is just like take one of those like, uh, like, cool, like those like cooling racks that you would like put cookies on after taking them out of the oven and just like put it behind the instrument and just like, you know, lightly so you're not like digging up the finish to the best of your ability and just like kind of hold it against yourself and see if you like the way that it sounds or you can just try holding the instrument it kind of makes the instrument resonate more because it's not flat on your stomach so yeah it's it's all kind of a lot of those the answer to all those questions is sort of you know it depends on what you like <laughs> but that's sort of my general thoughts anyway in the play along video jam, did you use alternate chords and substitutions for the chords? Uh, I've now forgotten about what song we're talking about, unfortunately. Um, but if you can tell me what song, then I'll maybe be able to answer that. Harvest Home, great tune. Kesh Jig, also great. I'll see if I can play some of those. Uh, Harvest Home.
Here's a little bit of Harvest Home. I can't remember catch jig off the top of my head. No, uh, that one's not going to come out, but maybe next time. <laughs> uh, uh, Denise says, curious why I don't hear you use it much in tunes you play. Oh, uh, tremolo. I just skipped the part. You tremolo very well. I'm curious why you don't use it much in tunes. I think for me, I don't use it because I'm often playing tunes. Um, I only, I will I'll occasionally use it, but if I use it, it's going to be in a slower tune, like in a waltz. Uh, It just like I think for me I play I think probably why I don't use it so much is I play a lot and kind of grew up playing a lot with fiddle players who have a wider variety of um, kind of ornamentation that they can use with a little more nuance than mandolin players can um, so often in terms of you know really most ornaments for me I use only kind of ornaments that take up less space often um so you know tremolo really is just kind of like all in and it can sound great if it's just a mandolin but if there's a fiddle player playing which often i'm playing with fiddle players or other melody instruments and if that's the case playing tremolo kind of over what everybody else is doing it's just adding a lot of notes and a lot of fill to a particular moment that can get really messy really quick um so i often leave that space open for other people you know if, if a fiddle player wants to do a roll or some other sort of uh, ornamentation and i'm doing tremolo it's just kind of filling in all that space it's going to make it hard to hear what everybody else is doing and then even, you know, when playing solo, I just, I'm just not really in the habit so much. I love the sound. Um, I think it's more of a habit thing than any, anything else. Uh, cool. James has been enjoying the mandolin and beer podcast lately. That's a great podcast. Uh, I was on that a couple, a couple months ago, like six months ago. Can't really remember, but uh, Daniel's awesome. He's doing a really cool thing. And everybody should check it out if you want to hear um, interviews with all kinds of mandolin players. Uh, it's a really fun time. Do I have a good cross-picking exercise? I would just, uh, you know, the biggest thing is keeping your right hand down, up, down, up all the time. And then just experimenting with different strings. So like D, A, E, A. D, A, E, A. I'm holding a D chord. Or you can try to like kind of walk little lines in there. Uh, two open open on the D A, D, A, and E strings. And then the melody, the kind of walking line. Two, four, five, four, two. And the biggest thing is just keeping your right hand with that constant down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down up pattern. Whoops. Drop the pick. And beyond that, I think I have some some other patterns and exercises on my website. Any tips for holding my pick more relaxed when playing folk music? Um, I would say go back through my beginner series. Um, you know, I, I often find that I gain the most in my own playing whether it's technique based or new skills based by really kind of focusing on the fundamentals. So, you know, if you're the biggest thing about staying relaxed is kind of being conscious about when you're relaxed and when you're not. So by playing simple songs, playing things slowly, revisiting your whole technique, you know, everything from left hand to right hand, um, working on what it feels like to be relaxed, you know, having, I kind of think of it as like a ready position of, you know, I can sit here like this and I'm very relaxed. Um, and then as soon as I start playing, I'm going to slowly tense up over time. So knowing what it feels like to be kind of ready to play and nice and relaxed 
and just kind of cultivating that feeling of, okay, I'm relaxed right now. I've got good general posture and technique. Um, I'm feeling nice and relaxed in my right hand, all that sort of stuff. And then I can kind of come back to that as I play and I'm working on new skills and new tunes and all that uh, technique stuff. Everything is going to naturally tense up. And then just being able to be like, okay, I'm getting tense, just going to sit back a little. And you can get to the point where you can kind of do that in a tune if you're playing. Sometimes you'll see me kind of, if I'm really getting tense, I'll just kind of roll my shoulders a little bit while playing. Just kind of, it's mostly a attention thing where you're like realizing that you're tense or you're relaxed and being able to adjust accordingly. Any tips? Uh, oh, wait, that's the same question. Um, and so, yeah, kind of going back to holding the pick, um, you know, hold it nice and loose. I always say, and I just did it, Drop if you drop your pick, that's a good sign because it means you're not really clamping down hard. If you clamp down hard, you're going to sound tense and you're not going to sound relaxed. And if you hold your pick nice and loose, it might float around in your hand a little bit, but you can make little micro adjustments to kind of keep it in line. And then your music will benefit from being nice and relaxed in that way. James says, tenor banjo is great for New Orleans style jazz too. It definitely is. I wish I knew how to play that style. Gail says, I find it easier to do bluesy embellishments to raggy bluesy tunes. East Tennessee blues, pig ankle rag. Yep. Would love to see more like that on your website. Cool. Yeah. I don't know a ton of those style tunes, but... I, I should do more because I love them and I should learn more of them. James says, just realized you're wearing a Trad Cafe shirt. Great podcast. Yes, yeah, another great podcast is uh, Trad Cafe. Uh, it's run by my friend Neil Perlman. Another kind of interview show with not not just mandolin players. I think there's some mandolin players. Maybe not. Um, but traditional musicians in general talking about kind of the traditional music they play, how they got into it, kind of how they integrate with the tradition of music that they play. Really interesting podcast. Definitely check that one out as well if that sounds interesting. Arkansas Traveler. I can do a little bit of that. Do you play any blues? Not really. Um, I can play along with blues, but I've, I've never really kind of studied that side of things. I'm going to work up some. Here's a little plug. Um, I've got a couple shows coming up if you're interested. I'll probably make a post about this later as well. Um, I'm going to pull up my calendar here, but on October, where do I get under there? Um, on I've got a show where I'm playing on October 28th, it's a third, Wednesday, <laughs> um, for one of my favorite venues of all time back in Maine, um, Blue. Uh, and I'll have, I'll make a post about this where you can find the links and stuff. Um, I'm going to be going live on there. Facebook and YouTube page and they've been doing um, concerts all the time so if you like Irish music it's mostly Irish um, music at this point but there's occasionally some other stuff in there um, but my partner Emma and I are going to be doing a show playing some Irish music for them I'll be playing mandolin and tenor banjo she plays fiddle um, I'll play some bazooki and tenor guitar various instruments um, so that's coming up on the 28th of October and um, in early November the 5th 6th, 7th, and 8th, I'm going to be teaching at Fiddle Hell, which is normally held in western Mass uh, uh, kind of central Massachusetts. And it's going to be a great weekend. It's all online, of course, this year. Um, and I'm going to be doing a blues workshop. So if you're interested in that, uh, check out fiddlehell.org. And you can, or you can find it on Facebook. Again, I'll do a, a more official post about this later. Where did I go here? Okay, I'm back. Uh, so request for Arkansas Traveler. can do that. With the mandolin, almost new to it, having a hard time learning how to strum evenly with the right hand. I think the biggest thing is just time. You know, it's work work on, go through my beginner series, but, you know, you're, people have a natural inclination towards having good time, um, but it's a hard thing to kind of physically create because it's a new skill. It's probably something you haven't done a whole lot of or have a whole lot of kind of comparable skills. It's a very kind of unique thing to learn to 
to kind of, you know, wield a pick and like have good time and consistency, you don't often run into that sort of need in other aspects of your life. So it requires taking the instrument and, you know, just spending the time. It's not going to be, you're, you're not going to be instantly, um, kind of granted good time just from picking up an instrument. Um, but the more you play, even if you're not focusing specifically on having good time, um, you will get better and your, your time will improve and your strumming patterns will improve. A big thing you can do, uh, I have a couple lessons on my website about strumming patterns and then maybe using those in conjunction with a metronome is a great way to kind of cult cultivate those strum patterns and keeping good time. Advice or technique to keep my right hand from moving towards the bridge as I play? Great question. Um, I think, again, almost the same answer to the last question. It's time. You're going to notice... The fact that you're noticing it is great. Um, so, as you get closer to the bridge, you can feel it in your hand. You get kind of more resistance to the pick. The sound gets a little tinnier. Um, you know, just noticing that it's happening, adjusting back to the kind of the sweet spot on your instrument, spending some time to find where that sweet spot is. You know, playing around with where on the instrument it sounds best to you. It's going to depend on your own opinions and kind of your instrument and your picking style. It's going to be a little different for everyone, so just find what you like best. And then when you notice it, bring your hand back and uh, over time you'll kind of, you'll learn to stay away from the spots that make it harder to play and don't sound as good. Coleman's March, another request, I can do that. So we got Coleman's March and Arkansas Traveler. What was the tune I was playing on the tenor banjo? I think it was Miss Monaghan, which I played at the beginning. <laughs> But maybe it wasn't. I can't totally remember. <laughs> um, but we're, that is the play along jam that's coming up probably in 10 minutes here at the end of the hour. Um, we're going to all do a little play along jam on Miss Monahan's. Oh, okay. You were, you were referring to Coleman's March in the question. Uh, what was I doing? Alternate chords and substitutions and double stops in Coleman's March. Probably. I can't remember. <laughs> um, I tend to naturally gravitate towards doing uh, chord substitutions and all that kind of stuff. And I often do it without noticing. So my answer is most likely yes. <laughs> when in doubt, assume that I'm doing something a little off kilter. <laughs> uh, Ant-Man says, okay, I'm going to play a tune here real quick. Uh, I'll do a little bit of, what was the one? Col oh, Coleman's March. Okay, I see. So I'll, I'll play a little Arkansas Traveler.
Arkansas Traveler. Got a little weird there, but it happens sometimes. Let's see. Uh, Ant-Man says, what are you working on lately? You have been playing a long time, so I'm curious what types of things you work on. You know, on Mandolin, I haven't been playing a whole lot of Mandolin kind of on my own time. In general, lately on Mandolin, I've been working kind of like a little bit at some jazz, um, just kind of like impro improvisation, kind of trying to get some keys that don't feel super familiar anymore back under my fingers. A little kind of like, just kind of working on. Kind of interesting chordal movements. Some interesting, like, kind of harmony ideas that kind of excite my ears. Not necessarily like working on particular tunes so much, but just kind of noodling around, seeing what kind of new kind of chord shapes and different things can kind of come out of my fingers that I can then say, oh, okay, that sounds cool. How can I use that in this way or the other? I think most of my time at this point has been spent, been playing a lot of banjo lately. Like I said earlier, working on some two finger style. Want to learn a little bit of three finger banjo as well. Um, playing a lot of electric instruments, a lot of electric tenor guitar, kind of getting comfortable with the world of electric instruments is, um, it's a whole nother world that I'm not very used to. Um, so it's fun playing around with that. Yeah, so that's kind of what I've been doing. Some of the best advice is from James. I got early on was from Tommy Emanuel. I can't argue with advice from him. Was that time spent with the metronome is the most valuable. I still don't do it enough. Yeah, metronomes kind of have a bad reputation as being kind of boring to work with and frustrating to work with. But that's because they don't lie. They don't sound particularly good, but they keep a beat. And that's the whole thing with metronomes. And I also don't play with a metronome enough. Um, so yeah, that's, you know, metronomes, even if, it, even if it's frustrating and maybe a little boring to work with, if you can find a way to make it fun. Um, I don't, I tend to use a metronome slowly a lot more than I try to like kind of use it to increase speed. I don't tend to set a metronome going and see, like, okay, how fast can I go? I usually set a metronome at like pretty slow and then work on, because that leaves so much space in there for, you know, it's a little harder in, in ways because there's so much space between your notes. Versus if you're playing fast. It's, it's a little more like your hand can get into a rhythm, whereas you're, for me, often using a metronome slowly kind of forces my, forces me to concentrate a little bit more on, okay, I've got so much space between this beat and the next beat of the met metronome. How can I stay on time within that more cavernous space? Glad, awesome. Gail says, I love playing with the metronome. Excellent. I, I like to hear that. <laughs> Lewis says your ability to scratch an itch and stay in time is amazing <laughs> maybe I'll do a lesson on it from Denise well I think I just have a lot of practice because I, I tend to be a kind of an itchy person so uh, and I also spent a lot of time playing contra dances where the beat is important <laughs> so you don't want to lose the beat so I kind of figure out you know if I'm like in a key or have a moment where I can hit an open string I can go Kind of figuring out how to keep your right hand moving and I do that sometimes too just to like relax my hand and if I'm feeling tight in my left hand just to 
kind of relax for a little bit. Takes a little bit of knowing kind of what string is going to work as a drone at any given time. But it's not really a technique that I would recommend, but I happen. it happens for me, so... Yeah, and man says metronomes are so frustrating. I agree. But, you know, even if you work with a metronome for like three minutes a day, you know, if you have a, like a good time playing a bunch of stuff that you really like doing, see if you can just throw in a couple minutes of metronome practice every day. And, you know, don't, don't feel like you need to gain anything necessarily from it. Just like put it on, try to stay with it for just for a couple minutes every day, and that'll really kind of help develop that skill. Metronomes helped me learn to tap my foot while playing, and this resulted in more relaxed playing over time. Yeah, that's definitely often, like, some people have trouble, like, figuring out where, just, like, where to clap your hands or where to, how to tap your foot while playing, like Denise was saying. And that having a metronome going can definitely help just give you another beat to work with to kind of get get a rhythm into your kind of into your body a little bit more. All right, I think I caught up with the chat amazingly just in time for a little bit of a play-along jam. So if you have your mandolin, uh, we're going to do a little bit of Miss Monaghan's classic Irish tune in the key of D. The way these work is it's just like the play-along jams that you've probably seen on my website on my YouTube channel. David L. says, I Real Pro is also a great practice tool. I think I know what you're talking about. I think I just got that a couple months ago. Is that the, like, the fake book? Yeah. I Real Pro is an amazing thing for, for jazz. Um, they have like every jazz tune under the sun. They give you the chord chart. You can make it play along in any key you want. You can speed it up and slow it down. You can make it change keys every time it goes through the cycle of the tune. Really powerful thing. I've been using that a lot to uh, try to get back into playing some jazz. Cool. Uh, Lewis says Magnus has a tempo workshop going on next week. Signed up. Should be interesting. So yeah, Magnus Zetterlund is an awesome mandolin player. He's got a website. I think the website's called mandolinsecrets.com. Maybe Lewis can confirm or deny that. Um, I did one of his workshops. I kind of co-led one of his workshops a bunch of months ago. Super fun. He's got a great thing going. And it sounds like he's got one on tempo coming up. So if you're interested in that, definitely check that out. He's a great mandolin player. Oh, cool. So if you're into bluegrass, apparently iReal Pro has a list of like a thousand bluegrass songs in the forum as well. I haven't even dove into that realm of it. I should check that out. It's not a super... Uh, the app is like 20 bucks or 30 bucks maybe. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a huge resource if, you're, if you like that style of, style of thing. Cool. So, uh, Miss Monahan's... Um, I'll start by playing the melody, and then I'll jump into some chords. Uncle Bobby has a great suggestion that I start with open chords. I'll stay, I'll start out, the first time I play through the chords, I'll try to keep it nice and kind of straight ahead. If you need, if you don't know the tune, um, this is a great time to just see what you can pick out. There's also the whole lesson on the website, if you need to like read the chord, ch chord chart, or uh, the tablature, or you can just come back to this later anytime once you've worked on the tune a little bit more do it a little not too fast but somewhere around there one two i'll start with the chords you play melody we'll swap back and forth here we go one two three four
You play the melody, I'll play the chords. Harmony. sense and you all enjoyed playing along that was a fun one i don't do i don't often do irish tunes as play alongs just because for me irish music is so focused on just playing the melody as a mandolin player so it's fun to 
and I also don't tend to do as much variation on Irish tunes, especially like melodic stuff and harmonies. It's a little outside what I'm what I'm used to, and it's kind of outside the tradition of Irish music in general. But it's fun to do, um, and certainly isn't out of the question. So, what do you want to do next week for the play along jam? Let me know in the comments as we wrap up here, and we'll we'll get another one lined up for next week. Um, if you want to come back to this or any of the other live streams in the future, uh, Denise actually makes an awesome kind of resource for everybody. That if you go to my website, mandolessons.com, you click on the green live Q and A button, I think it is, and then you scroll down a little in the window that pops up. There's some resources where you can find uh, kind of lesson indexes where she's got it linked so you can find w particular topics that I'm talking about in every lesson. Also, if you're looking for a particular um, tune that I play, there's also like a tune index PDF. Um, and those are super helpful. So thank you, Denise, for keeping those around and, and going together. It's no, no small feat. All right, so I think I'm all caught up with the chat. Limerick Rake. I don't even, I don't know that tune. I'll have to look it up. Yeah, so the ones that are on my website are helpful so people can, can uh, make it happen. Or people can kind of know what we're getting into before we get to it. Denise has great suggestions. Cole Harbor Bend or Julianne Johnson. Have we not done Julianne Johnson? Um, oh, I did Julianne Johnson as a, I'm just getting confused because I did it as an actual lesson recently. Let's do Cole Harbor Bend. That's a fun one. It's a, that's a tune that's a little uncommon. It's a little crooked, which is fun. Um, so yeah, check out that tune. We'll do it next time um, as the play along jam. It's in the key of G. It's pretty straight ahead, but it is, it's got a little crooked moment in it. So that'll be fun to uh, do a little play along to. It'll keep my brain uh, active. <laughs> but thank you all so much for um joining me today it's always fun to do these um thanks to everyone who did the super chat and the paypal donations and patreon links in the description all that support yeah, i've got t-shirts as well so any support is greatly appreciated but not required um if you like these sort of things and want to be part of one that's a little more mellow i do patron only live streams once a month um on my patreon page so yeah, with these, I don't know how many, there's usually like 40 to 80 people in these Saturday live streams. It's kind of, the chat goes as fast as I can barely keep up with. But in, on the Patreon live streams, I get to dive in a little deeper. So if you like these sort of things, that might be up your alley. Anyone, any, uh, anyone who supports at $5 plus a month gets access to those. M. Porter says, do you offer private lessons via Zoom? I don't. If anyone's interested in live lesson, uh, kind of live one-on-one -on -one private lessons, um, shoot me an email and I can send you to some, I've got some great mandolin playing friends that do offer that and I'm happy to send you their way. Um, or you can look up on Mandolin Cafe either in the forum or I think there is like a, a lesson part of the classifieds on Mandolin Cafe where you can find um, different folks that do Skype lessons and Zoom lessons and stuff like that. Once again, thank you all so much for joining me today, and I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Bye-bye.